tomorrow, as many of you are aware, marks a major anniversary, not only in Memphis, but also in, in the United States. It's the 46th anniversary of a tragedy that happened right here in our city, the assassination of Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. This weekend also marks a wonderful event, and that is the reopening of the renovated and enhanced National Civil Rights Museum. Hampton Sides has written for magazines including the National Geographic, the New Yorker, Esquire, Preservation and Men's Journal, and he's an editor at large for Outside Magazine. In Hellhound on His Trail, the electrifying account of the largest manhunt in American history, he details James Earl Ray's stalking of Martin Luther King and the international manhunt that followed the murder. One of the great pleasures of my semester has been reading this book with students, a few chapters a week, and we have talked about it for hours, discussing its vigorous prose, pungent detail, colorful education of personalities, and skillful depiction of political, historical, and cultural context. We keep remarking on how much suspense there is, even though we know how the, the tragic story ends. The book vivifies Memphis history and shows us familiar streets and landmarks in extraordinary close-ups from 1968. Oh, the Oprah Magazine, Time, The Washington Post, St. Louis Dispatch, and the San Francisco Chronicle all named the book one of the best of the year. If you read it, you will know Memphis better the violence, the complexity, how the aftermath of that event in 1968 continues to this day. As a native Memphian, Mr. Sides brought the project his considerable understanding of and appreciation for the city where he grew up. He graduated from Yale and today lives in New Mexico. Tonight, he is home. His other award-winning books include Blood and Thunder, about frontiersman Kit Carson and the American West, and ghost soldiers about the 1945 U.S. mission to rescue POWs in the Philippines. Literary critic Jonathan Yardley calls Hampton Sides the scribe among our tribes. In an interview, Mr. Sides explained, much of my journalism is about subcultures. America is an archipelago of tribes, a land where people form national families of kindred spirits. I've been an anthropologist of modern America, whether it's Marines or Tupperware sales ladies, I'm fascinated by the hallmarks of the American tribe. It has to do with growing up in Memphis. I'll read one passage that was particularly striking to my students and me from Hellhound on His Trail. Of Memphis, he says, a city with a history that was rich and gothic and weird. Memphis has always had a touch of madness, but also a prodigious and sometimes profane sense of humor. A town known for its outlandish characters and half-demented geniuses, wrestlers, riverboat captains, inventors, gamblers, snake oil salesmen, musicians high on some peculiar native vibe. His talk tonight is entitled Telling Stories, the Art and Craft of Narrative History, and there will be time for some Q&A after his talk. Please welcome Hampton Simons. Hi. It's so great to be back. I uh, was born and raised in Memphis. I love this city. Um, and uh, got some Central Barbecue today, uh, just to kind of get, get it under my belt. Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, thank you for the great um, introduction. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how I got on this path of, of writing narrative nonfiction, narrative history. Where did it come from? Uh, it's been a long and circuitous path, and, uh, but I realized that it all did begin here in Memphis with the first, with the first writer that I ever met. Uh, it's a, these first encounters that you, that you have sometimes are very, very important. Uh, the first writer I ever met was Shelby Foote. Um, you know, the bearded sage from the PBS documentary, the great C Civil War historian. Um, 
I was in a rock band uh, with Shelby Foote's son, Huggy Foote, uh, for a while, and, and uh, he was working on the third volume of this 6,000-page trilogy of the Civil War, and Huggy and I were doing pretty much everything we could do, possibly, to prevent Shelby from finishing uh, his book. Uh, you know, cranking up the Hendrix and the uh, Pink Floyd, uh, and uh, Shelby came up in his smoking jacket with his pipe and his beard and his magnif magnificent Delta accent, and he rapped on the door, and there may or may not have been smoke in the room, I, I'm not at liberty to say. Uh, and he said, you know, Huggy, turn that rocket down. I'm working on acrobatics. <laughs> I don't like you, you know, like Appomattox. Um, what's Appomattox? I don't think we appreciated what Shelby was up to, and it took me many years to, uh, to fully understand what narrative history was. Um, I did go to Yale, which had a kind of a heavyweight history department, some great historians, some great uh, uh, both critics and, and essayists of history, but the word narrative was never really used. Uh, in those days, uh, to describe what history, serious history, could be. Um, we learned how to argue. We learned how to uh, analyze, and we learned how to, we, le we learned art uh, expository like But we didn't really talk about the narrative. I also don't really remember, remember the word pleasure <laughs> ever being used to describe what history could be, the writing of it, the reading of it, the whole experience. Uh, as I recall, most of the, the folks in that department, uh, heavyweights though they were, were, you know, they were just deadly serious. And this was a very serious business. Uh, historians were supposed to be these people who put on robes and commune with dead people, uh, using these secret methodologies that no one except PhDs are supposed to know, uh, how, you know how to use. Uh, so I was daunted by history and had no idea that uh, I would actually write it uh, when I graduated. I actually got into journalism and spent 20 years writing for newspapers, for magazines, uh, for uh, radio, and, and a little bit for television, uh, thinking I'd be a journalist. Uh, but through a circuitous course, I ended up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and got uh, interested in the story of the Bataan Death March and in World War II. More people from New Mexico than from any other state were killed in the Bataan Death March. And so consequently, I met all these old vets uh, in the state and uh, started to hear their stories and began to piece together this history of the Death March and the rescue near the end of the war of the last survivors of the Bataan Death March. So suddenly I was a historian, I realized, and had stopped being a journalist and sort of made this transition back into narrative history. What is narrative history? Uh, you know, I think it bears um, a little bit of a, a definition um, here at the outset. I've always been disappointed with the nomenclature of my profession. Um, Nonfiction. You know, why, does that, why is there a negative in front of my profession? <laughs> I mean, shouldn't it really be the other way around? Uh, there's the real stuff, and then there's, you know, the, the bullshit, uh, the made-up stuff. Uh, <laughs> nothing against fiction. Uh, I love it. I read novels all the time. But this idea that nonfiction, uh, that you have to put this word in front of it, otherwise you just have to assume that it's all made up. Um, so, anyway, there's that. Um, there's also, um, you know, a, a great debate in academic circles about what you call this stuff. Uh, is it creative writing? Well, that kind of... That's a perfectly good word, but it implies already that you're kind of making stuff up. Um, is it, um, you know, literary, literary history or literary nonfiction? You know, yes, but that sort of sounds precious. Sounds like, uh, you know, we're really trying to be uh, more important than, than perhaps we are. So I never really quite know what to call it. I, I call it narrative history. And, and, you know, essentially the idea of narrative history is uh, the, the thesis, if you will, is... And then what happened? And then what happened? And then what happened? The thesis is to keep the pages turning. Uh, if you ask Shelby Foote, who was, you know, the irony that I do this and le learned all this and uh, realized that one of the greatest practitioners of narrative history in my generation was this guy that I met in Memphis as a kid, it, it, it's kind of extraordinary. But 
if you ask Shelby Foote, what's the thesis of your three-volume, uh, um, 6,000-page trilogy, uh, he, would, he would probably laugh. He would have laughed at you. Uh, there's no thesis. The thesis is, these are great characters. Well, this is an, an amazing story. Uh, there's suspense. There's an arc to the story. There's great plot. There's twists and turns. There's this amazing story. Uh, and isn't that good enough? Uh, of course you argue your thesis and your end notes. There's lots of little, little decisions you have to make. Um, of course, uh, argumentation plays a role in any kind of history. But uh, for narrative history, it's, it's a minor role. The real, the real uh, goal, the driving force of, of, of what I try to do is to keep the pages turning and, and to keep uh, people interested in what happens. Uh, so, um, I, uh, I did this book, Ghost Soldiers, which uh, got me interested in, in seriously pursuing this full time as a, as a historian. And uh, that led me to another book, uh, Blood and Thunder, which I um, worked on for almost five years. Uh, it is a kind of epic story of manifest destiny and the role that this guy Kit Carson played in the conquest of the West. Um, he's kind of a Forrest Gump character, this backwoodsman, this illiterate guy from Missouri who somehow miraculously intersected with history time and time and time again. So that he provided kind of a connective tissue uh, for understanding all these disparate events all over the American West. Um, so by that point, I had made a decision to live full time in Mexico, and here was this kind of pivotal character from uh, my state's history that uh, that no one really knew much about. Was he a villain? Was he a hero? Something in between? Uh, hard to say. But uh, it kept me busy for about uh, four or five years, and uh, that was my longest book, and uh, I think in many ways my best book, uh, most complicated, most nuanced book. Um, then I decided I needed to come back home. Uh, I think all writers at some point feel the need to come back to their hometown, to the place where they're born and raised. Um, and in this case, to come back to the most pivotal moment in the history of the place where I was born and raised. Um, I think the um, King assassination is uh, sort of unfinished business here in Memphis. We're still sifting it. We're still trying to figure it out. It was, without question, uh, one of those seismic events that uh, needs to be reinterpreted and uh, reconsidered every every year on this anniversary, but um, also just in general. I think the nation is trying to figure out what, what it meant and uh, how it changed the country uh, and, and what's to be, uh, uh, what, what sort of positive, if there's any kind of positive uh, thing that we can draw from it and move forward uh, as a nation. Uh, so that book kept me for, kept me, kept me busy for about three years as well. Um, I, I'll tell you this real quickly that uh, I was very worried about my source material for that book. I didn't know what I was going to do and how I was going to uh, do something different. Uh, maybe find some sort of uh, trove that hadn't been located before. And uh, I was doing a lot of research here um, at the University of Memphis. And um, I was given uh, a, um, a business card from one of the curators here. Uh, a delightful gentleman has gave me this uh, card from a businessman, uh, rather a former policeman uh, in Memphis named Vince. He said, oh, there's this guy. His name is Vince. He's got some stuff. <laughs> Pretty good stuff. And uh, I, I thought, well, this is probably not going to work out. Um, doesn't sound very promising. Um, I tucked that business card in my pocket and didn't call him for over a year. But I finally did call Vince, and uh, he was very suspicious of me, didn't know what I was up to. Uh, we met in the back room of a back room of a back room of, of the Memphis Public Library, and uh, he showed me this laptop that he had, and I think perhaps he thought I was uh, maybe an FBI guy, or perhaps I was a conspiracy nut or something. I don't know what he thought, but um, he was a little bit skeptical of me at first. But then he began to show, show me the stuff that he had been collecting and digitizing for 25 years. 
thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of documents from uh, Interpol, from Scotland Yard, from the Canadian Royal Mounted Police, uh, Memphis Police, um, dispatcher recordings, crime scene photos, all of this stuff never before published. Um, and I just thought, well, gosh, this is really amazing. Uh, who are you, Vince? Um, Vince became the ace in the hole, my ace in the hole for this book, and he helped me uh, in terms of uh, wherever I was in the story. Uh, let's say I was in Canada following James Earl Ray uh, when he uh, was about to attempt to rob a grocery store in Toronto. I, I would call Vince and say, Vince, uh, do you have anything on that time when he was trying to rob the grocery store? And, and he would say, uh, yeah, do I ever? Um, and he would send me this email that it was so much data that it would cause the lights to dim, you know, in, in my house. And uh, all this material would show up just on that little period. He had it so well organized. And uh, I mean, it was so much material that I, there's no other way for me to process it than to kind of take it in little chunks as I went along through the story. So I don't know if Vince is even here tonight. I, I hope he is. He's an amazing man. Vince Hughes uh, was the dispatcher on duty that night, April 4th, uh, was the man who put out the first um, uh, description of James Earl Ray. And this event touched him so completely that he, he really devoted the rest of his life to collecting and digitizing all of these documents, which he is uh, going to put up on, you know, as a, as a website, a database for, for the general public. Uh, so no matter what your persuasion is, if you're, you know, anti-conspiracy or pro-conspiracy or what, whatever your beliefs might be, there's this huge database that is going to be available. Uh, and I, I was able to, to use that. Which brings me to uh, my, my next book, which is coming out in August, uh, uh, with the icy title, uh, In the Kingdom of Ice. Uh, it's, this is a story about a very early American attempt on the North Pole, uh, the voyage of the USS Jeanette. How many of you have heard of the USS Jeanette? Like two, this is good, this is good. This is what I was banking on. I had never heard of it. I found out about it sort of by accident. And it was one of these stories that was a huge tale in its day. Uh, it was very, very well known. It was very consequential. Um, but it's kind of fallen between the cracks for, for a variety of reasons. It was 35 years before Shackleton, which is probably the best known of those uh, polar stories. Uh, but it was, it was the North Pole, not the South. It was an American voyage, uh, not British. And um, it was um, uh, undertaken by the U.S. Navy, but paid for by an eccentric uh, newspaper publisher named James Gordon Bennett, who was a larger-than-life Gilded Age uh, character. I'm going to talk just a little bit about it. Can you turn down the lights a bit? There's, I want to get these uh, slides going. Okay, so in the um, Gilded Age, in, in the 1870s, uh, the North Pole was an absolutely, uh, you know, was an absolute obsession in the United States. People had to know what was up there. They they had to uh, almost like there was a room in their attic and they couldn't get to it. And they had to know what was in that room. It was one of the few places that was left on the planet that had not been explored. Um, but there was all kinds of weird theories about what might be up there. Uh, civilizations that might be living up there, or uh, holes in the earth leading down into you know, cavities, cavities of, the, of the earth. Um, also, one of the big, big ideas was that there was a warm body of water um, that uh, was up there. That if you could somehow bust through a little bit of ice, you would eventually reach this open polar sea um, and have smooth sailing to the North Pole and there would be marine life and it would be balmy and warm. Um, this sounds like a crazy idea today, um, although it is, you know, probably with climate change, there will come a time soon when, um, at least during summertime, significant uh, <coughs> portions of the, of the ice cap will, will melt. Where did this idea come from? It's, uh, it's an ancient idea that went back to the Greeks and the Vikings um, and, and to 
in particular, this map, a, a Mercator map from 1592, that showed these four symmetrically arranged rivers leading to this um, open polar sea uh, with a mountain in the middle, which was made entirely of iron. This is why, you know, compasses seem to point to the north. This was the theory, anyway. But the thing about maps, and, and, and good maps, beautiful maps like this, is that once you plan an idea in the imagination, it becomes really, really hard to get rid of that idea. Uh, and a lot of people have to die, basically, uh, before you're able to, you know, discard that idea. Um, the voyage of the USS Jeanette was the kind of the last attempt to prove that there was this open polar sea. There's a lot of other theories up that there was a place called Ultima Thule that was talked about as this warm place north of uh, Scandinavia. Uh, the Greeks, of course, talked about Hyperborea. Um, so, you know, some of the ideas of an open polar sea began to take um, shape when we began to learn more and more about the um, about the uh, Gulf Stream, which is, of course, the powerful current that leads you know, from the tropics to the north and goes past Norway and uh, warms the ports uh, as far as, far as like Murmansk and Russia. Uh, so it, these, these are important currents. They, they, are, you know, they do kind of regulate the, the heat, heat of the world. And uh, people began to think, well, where does this current ultimately go? And the, the leading theory was that it tunnels under the ice and goes to the North Pole and therefore proves uh, it rather replenishes uh, the open polar sea. There's supposed to be another current, and there in fact is another current in the Pacific Ocean um, called the Kuro Siwo, which does sort of the same thing. It heads towards the north, and um, the thought was perhaps it goes through the Bering Strait, tunnels under the ice, meets the Gulf Stream from the other side of the planet, and uh, they uh, have a confluence at the North Pole. Um, Sort of this beautiful idea, perfectly symmetrical, that the planet regulates its own heat uh, by uh, bringing this warm water from the south to the north. Uh, obviously, hopeless, hopelessly, hopelessly wrong. Uh, and the, the man of my voyage, of course, discovered that. Here we go, the supposed open sea. But when you have maps like this, uh, it really becomes difficult to dislodge the concept. And uh, the, the folks who were leading this expedition had a, had a, lot, a lot of work to do to kind of um, prove this, pr prove that it wasn't true. Um, now, there are a lot of other wacky ideas that kind of figured into the culture at the time. Um, there was a guy named Sims uh, who had a, a, a phenomenally popular lecture tour in which he talked about um, holes at the poles. This idea that there were these giant holes leading down into the earth, one at the North Pole, one at the South Pole, and that there was a lost civilization you know, living inside, uh, living inside uh, the earth. <laughs> this idea still has some currency. There are actually still websites uh, that talk about um, where, where the UFOs really come from. They actually come from inside the earth. And, <laughs> occasionally uh, come out of these portals at the North and South Pole, and uh, th th there's a great conspiracy to cover up these holes. They're there. We, NASA has, just won't let us see them. Here's a more recent... Uh... Anyway, so this is a baby, you know, this is an old, old idea that doesn't seem to really want to go away. And then it uh, got a little bit more currency um, when Jules Verne here, uh, published his book, Journey to the Center of the Earth, um, which talks more and more about um, cavities in the Earth at the North Pole and uh, leading down into this polar sea that he said was underground. It was kind of a subterranean uh, body of water. That if you could just find it, uh, you would find on its shores all these creatures and mastodons and dinosaurs and, uh, and uh, also an early race of, of mankind. Uh, I just kind of go on a little jag about St. Nick, uh, briefly in the book. Uh, the idea that St. Nicholas lives at the North Pole, and that you know, has this jolly man who lives up there, and uh, I thought it was an ancient idea, but it turns out it, it dated from this period, just before my book. 
Uh, and some of these um, illustrations from harbors uh, that begin to show uh, Santa Claus in his workshop up at the North Pole. Uh, also, just kind of showing just how obsessed people were in this period with with the North Pole and wanting to know what was truly what was truly up there. And there was another scientist who kind of figures into the story. Um, this gentleman with the uh, really exquisite facial hair. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of facial hair in this book. Um, this is um, Dr. August Peterman, uh, who was the greatest map maker in the world at that time in the 1870s. He lived in a village, a small city in Germany called Gotha, and he made these exquisite maps uh, of, the, of the world, which he constantly updated with uh, information that came from uh, Gilded Age explorers. Um, and he would uh, uh, refine his maps, but it just drove him insane that he could not really depict what was at the North or the South Pole. Uh, it was hypothetical territory. He had his own theories about what was up there, but uh, so, so he promoted these explorations all over the world and uh, did a lot to kind of create the theoretical groundwork for um, how you might go to some place like the North Pole. These are some of his maps and, and uh, atlases. It was sort of like the Google Earth of its, of its day. I mean, these were perfectly detailed maps that showed everything, you know, like uh, where the transatlantic cables were laid and uh, the, the camel routes, the caravan routes across Africa, and, um, you know, just unbelievably detailed maps. This is the United, his map in the United States in the 1860s. Uh, he had some kind of wacky ideas about what was up at the North Pole, and this, this map shows a little of that. Greenland, he thought, was, was, had this kind of long extension, kind of like an elephant's trunk, that went across the pole, or the edge of the pole, and ended up at a little island, uh, what we now know as an island, called Wrangell Island, off the coast of Siberia. He thought it was part of this massive transpolar continent, and uh, that the way to get to the North Pole was to sail up the coast of this, of this continent and eventually reach the open polar sea. There it is again. Kind of a preposterous looking landmass, but uh, he was adamant. He was obstinate. You know, this is, this, this is what it looks like, and uh, you'll have smooth sailing up that coastline. So my expedition uh, was paid for and was really kind of the brainchild of this man, um, a outlandish character from the Gilded Age named uh, James Gordon Bennett. Uh, he was the third richest man in New York. At the time, he was the inheritor, the editor, and uh, uh, publisher of the New York Herald, which was the largest newspaper in the world at that time. And he was kind of known for creating these stunts, these journalism stunts, and uh, sending people to the ends of the earth to discover things. He was the one who sent Stanley to find Livingston in Africa and uh, got an enormous you know, uh, increase in circulation because of those dispatches. And so he was looking for another um, stunt uh, or another expedition uh, to increase the circulation of his paper. He was kind of a crazy guy, did a lot of things like um, uh, he was into speed walking. Um, he was a champion speed walker. Uh, he was uh, the youngest commodore of the New York Yacht Club. He um, committed a lot of social faux pas, like he once urinated in a, in, into a grand piano at a, a social function in front of lots of people and ladies and uh, uh, was ostracized and was literally you know, kicked out of the United States um, and lived most of his life in Paris. Um, he also, uh, what else did he do? Oh, I don't know. This is just a cop, one of his newspapers. This was the New York Herald office in, in New York. Him a, li a little bit later in life. Um, <coughs> just a real character. Uh, this is one of his yachts, the, um, the Lysistrata, where, which had a... Um, uh, a padded cell in, in the middle of the, of the yacht where he kept um, dairy cows so he could have cream, uh, fresh cream, you know, every day. Um, this is 
a painting, a pretty famous painting of, of Bennett on one of his yachts. He was uh, really into sports, and um, is called the father of American tennis because he brought competitive tennis, lawn tennis, to, to the U.S., to Newport, to a place that he had built called the Newport Casino, which is now the National Hall of Fame of, of American tennis. Uh, and this was all happening during, while this, uh, the voyage of the Jeanette was, uh, was going on. He also got into auto racing a little later, created his own cup, uh, and uh, also balloon racing, uh, really big into balloon racing. And there is to this day something called the Gordon Bennett Cup, which is uh, uh, kind of the Super Bowl of, of international uh, balloon racing. He, he also did all these kinds of weird stunts, like this paper, uh, I don't know if you can see that. He, uh, his paper, ran this article saying that a bunch of animals had escaped from the New York Zoo, the Central Park Zoo. And uh, there was consternation in the city, bravery, panic, uh, a shocking Sabbath carnival of death. They, they ate a bunch of people, they named a bunch of people, they named these people. And uh, the city just went crazy. They thought this was real and uh, people left in droves and tried to get out of the city. Uh, and it was just this little kind of April Fool's joke that, that his paper pulled. So these are the kinds of stories that he was always doing. Now Stanley, of course, was his biggest story. He sent Stanley to find Livingston, even though Livingston really didn't need to be found. He, he wasn't lost. Um, and it was just kind of a, 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 almost kind of a, to create this sensation um, that they, they somehow had this magical you know, reunion in the middle of nowhere, in, in, uh, somewhere in Africa. No one was really clear uh, where Livingston was, but he wasn't lost. He had intended, he had intended to go to Africa, and he, he was right on schedule. Um, he also became a best-selling uh, author when he published this book, and you know it was just something that uh, really somehow summed up the age. And uh, Bennett was looking for a an encore to the Stanley Livingston story. So he bought this yacht, the USS Jeanette, and had it massively reinforced for the ice, because um, they knew that they were going to encounter ice. They thought they'd just bust through this bit of ice and then they'd hit that open polar sea. It'd be quite easy after that. But they had it uh, rebuilt from the inside out. Uh, to, captain, uh, to command the ship, uh, he picked this guy, George Washington DeLong, who was a U.S. Navy officer, and uh, another uh, a guy named George Melville, who was related to Herman Melville, uh, became kind of the second in command. Um, and uh, they left from San Francisco in the summer of 1879, going north towards Alaska, which had only recently been purchased from Russia, uh, to, uh, to try to follow this warm water current up to, um, up to the North Pole. Also on board uh, this expedition was uh, inventions of this, the inventions of this man. Uh, Thomas Edison had just invented the light bulb and uh, it crammed the hull with uh, lots of inventions like um, lights because you go to the Arctic, what do you want for a big part of the winter when it's just pitch black for six months? You want light, and uh, so they got uh, Edison's lights, and also equipment from uh, Alexander uh, Bell, uh, Graham Bell, and um, uh, uh, telegraph equipment from Morse. They were hoping to just kind of string up all this ele electrical stuff over the ice so they could communicate with each other uh, when they sent parties out of the ice. Um, this is uh, George DeLong, the captain's wife, Emma DeLong. Uh, they they part ways in uh, in the summer of of 79, and, and she thinks he's going to be back in just a short time, maybe six months, maybe a year at the most. Well, he's gone for um, a, a year, he gets, gets uh, caught in the ice, locked in the ice. Uh, a year becomes a year and a half, becomes two years of drifting in the ice. Um, these men are fine, they've got plenty of food, but they're just going absolutely insane. Um, and uh, they're drifting slowly but surely in the direction of the North Pole. Uh, so that, that part seemed to be working out well, but they were slowly running out of food. This kind of shows uh, where, 
their path through the Bering Strait, through the Chukchi Sea, and then uh, they were last sighted near this place called Wrangell Island, which uh, we now know is, is just an island, a large island, but um, it was the last place they were uh, seen by some Arctic whalers who were up there. Uh, so I wanted to go to, uh, to see this place, Wrangell Island, and uh, it's only recently opened up to some very minimal uh, amount of tourism. I thought I would just be able to go from Alaska and uh, go right up there and see it. Well, it doesn't work that way. I had to go to Moscow, uh, get about four or five different permits. Um, got a really nice haircut there. Um, uh, it was going to be a long trip because once, once I got all the permits, which seemed to take forever, uh, then I took a series of planes across eight or maybe it's nine time zones all the way around the world to uh, the east coast of Siberia, to this place, Anadir, where I picked up a, a Russian uh, icebreaker with a group of scientists and uh, some sort of eco-tourists and some serious birders. Uh, <laughs> and we took this ship up the, uh, up the coast of uh, Siberia, uh, through the Bering Strait toward, um, toward Wrangell Island. I was from that place right there. You can look back and you can wave at Sarah Palin. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you can't see Alaska. <laughs> this is a village in Siberia that we stopped at. But uh, uh, and often the ice has been uh, completely absent. But this particular year, there was a record amount of ice in that part of the Arctic, and uh, thicker and thicker ice. Um, this is a video. I just took this with an iPhone, but you get the idea. Start to be. I'm starting to get glad that it is in fact a Russian icebreaker. <laughs> They were excited about the birds. Let me get a This is taken from the bow of the ship. that DeLong and his men were starting to encounter um, and drifted through for two years until finally um, the, the, the vessel, um, well, I'm not going to tell you about that because I'm, we're going to talk a little bit about Wrangell Island, which I did finally get to. And uh, Wrangell Island is this amazing place. Um, I, I went there partly for the book, but also to write a story for National Geographic. Um, because there's this Russian photographer named Sergei Gorshkov who's taking these just amazing photographs uh, over the last 10 years from, um, from Wrangell. So some of these are his and some of these are mine. Uh, you'll tell, you can tell the good ones are, are his. Um, 
although I took this with an iPhone, it's not too bad. Uh, it's just an extraordinary place. Uh, uh, it's considered, it's, it's called the Galapagos of, of the Arctic. It's the, um, it's got the, the largest uh, uh, colony of, of walrus and, and uh, snow geese and um, Arctic fox, huge Arctic fox population. Uh, and it's the large, largest um, denning ground uh, for polar bears in the world. <clears throat> because the ice has not been very reliable in recent years, um, because it, you know, polar bears prefer to be out on the ice doing what they do best, you know, hunting for seals, um, but because there's often not been reliable ice, they've been coming to this island and using it as a refuge and congregating in really large numbers, which is not normal for, for polar bears. They, they're not particularly social creatures, you know. One, they come in ones and twos, but not large extended families like this. They just kill the walrus. Um, this is one of Sergei's pictures. Uh, a lot of fox, they eat on, they, they survive on lemmings and, and mostly and, uh, and the eggs of snow geese. <laughs> a lot of muskox up there too. Not really very friendly creatures. <laughs> Even amongst themselves. Um, oh yeah, this is a polar bear guard on the uh, Russian bathhouse that they have on the island. Six inch nails. Um, this is a picture of me uh, with a, a woolly mammoth tusk. Because the other thing about Wrangell Island is it was the last place on Earth where woolly mammoths lived uh, a couple of thousand years beyond when they became extinct on the mainland. And there's these tusks everywhere. I mean, just all over, you know, in ravines and uh, riverbeds, and you just kind of pick them up. They're just kind of, kind of everywhere. Okay, so Emma DeLong um, is starting to wonder after two years where, you know, where's the Jeanette? Why hasn't, hasn't there been any tidings of this vessel? And so she was successful in getting uh, Congress and the U.S. Navy to send ships north and all, all over the Arctic to try to find the Jeanette. So the Jeanette becomes this much bigger story of all these re relief vessels uh, who themselves get into all kinds of trouble. Um, but on um, one of the vessels was um, the U.S. Revenue Cutter uh, Corwin, which came out of San Francisco. They went up through the Bering Strait trying to find uh, DeLong and trying to get to Wrangell Island, which, which was where he, he had been last sighted. On board that vessel was this man, um, kind of the father of the American environmental movement, John Muir, uh, who at that time was living in San Francisco and was a young journalist who wrote for the San Francisco papers. And uh, he captured all of this in this amazing book called The Cruise of the Corwin. So it, the story becomes largely the story of trying to find the Jeanette on board um, the Corwin with, with John Muir as, as a narrator. It's not a very well-known book of his, and of course he's much better known uh, for his efforts to uh, preserve Yosemite and um, uh, creating the, the Sierra Club in, in San Francisco, uh, but this was what he did as a, as a young man. Kind of a wild-looking dude, though. Um, Muir and his party actually got to Wrangell Island. There wasn't much ice that summer. Uh, and they got on to Wrangell Island. They were the first uh, modern day uh, explorers to actually get to Rock Wrangell Island to, to describe it. Uh, when they did, they raised an American flag over it and called it American soil. And uh, it's kind of controversial today because there are a large, uh, there's a group of Americans who want to still want to declare it U.S. soil and, and take, it, sort of take it back from the Russians. Uh, and there's a big, fierce debate about um, ownership of this place, Wrangell Island. Uh, where was the Jeanette, though? Well, the Jeanette was about 1,000 miles to the west at this point, way out over the coast of Siberia, uh, way up um, north to the northwest. 
And uh, finally, the ice uh, crushed the vessel and it sank and uh, all the way to the bottom of the uh, uh, Arctic Ocean. So you, so you have 33 men and their dogs out on the ice cap about 1,000 miles from the nearest landmass, mm. trying to figure out, well, what do we do? What do we do next? So they have to drag their boats. Their only hope for salvation is to drag their boats over the ice cap, hoping that they will reach uh, open water. And in many ways, that's where my story starts. That's the real you know, uh, meat of the story, which is a survival story, an adventure story about how these men uh, made it home. I won't tell you exactly what happens. You'll have to buy the book in August, but uh, they, some of them make it home. Um, let's get through some of these. It's in this part of the story is very kind of a classic Arctic story. You know, you have all your all your classic elements: scurvy, you know, your scurvy, uh, your mutiny, and your cannibalism. Uh, you know, good times. Uh, there's not actually cannibalism. They're, they were too tired. Uh, they make their way towards uh, slowly but surely towards the, the Russian coast and uh, thread through these islands. Along the way, they discover three islands and, and name them again for the United, claim them for the United States. They're still to this day known as the DeLong Islands, and uh, one of them is called Bennett Island, which was named after James Warden Bennett. There it is. I'm in the middle of the middle of nowhere. Eventually, they do reach open water and uh, have to get into these boats, uh, which are very precarious, and uh, they make their way towards, uh, towards the main landmass of Siberia. Uh, they do encounter a gale and get separated, and the story becomes then the story of these three different boats, and, and, and they're, three different, uh, they're three different fates. Where they make landfall is this place. It's, um, it's the delta of the world's uh, eighth largest river. It's called the Lena River. And it flows north into the Arctic Ocean. And uh, because it freezes at its delta first, it creates this massive land, uh, excuse me, ice barrier. And uh, this is a satellite image of it. Uh, this ice barrier forms and the water is still pumping through and it really doesn't know where to go. So it just kind of spreads out all over the place exaggerating the, the, the kind of fantail that you normally get with the delta. Uh, and this was the place where they made landfall and, of course, got horribly lost in these, this labyrinth of thousands of islands and channels and lakes and ponds. And um, depending on where they made landfall, um, their, their fate uh, was, was pretty much um, uh, this described or circumscribed by, by, this, by this topography group. I did go to the Lena Delta and walked over the, the, this topography. I, I love when I'm doing these books whenever possible to, to go physically to the place. And uh, that took about four or five more permits to get there. It's a restricted area in uh, northern Siberia. Um, there are survivors, like I say. Some made it home. This is a picture of some of them. Uh, taken in Yakutsk in, in the middle of Siberia uh, shortly after they made it back to civilization. Bennett got his uh, scoop. He, uh, 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 hundreds of stories were published about the Jeanette and its fate, and uh, it was a bigger story than, than Stanley finding Livingston um, in terms of circulation, in terms of uh, what he got out of this. Uh, also led to several best-selling books in the 1880s. Uh, I went, like I said, to um, Siberia, to the place where some of the, those who did die uh, were buried. And uh, they buried them up on this uh, mountain. It's called, to this day, it's called America Mountain in the middle of Siberia. Uh, the Russians know about it, but not very many Americans do. Uh, in fact, I, I could be, I likely am, the, the only American who's been there since the 1880s. Um, and uh, it's just this very bleak uh, grave site. Uh, they built a replica of it on the grounds of the, uh, of the Naval Academy at, in Annapolis. It's the DeLong Memorial and the, uh, the Jeanette Memorial. 
and it's on the banks of the Severn River there. Uh, DeLong and some of the uh, other explorers were ultimately buried in, um, in the Bronx in an unbelievable cemetery there called uh, Woodlawn. Uh, DeLong is sort of worshipped in, in the Navy Academy as one of the great exploration heroes of the Navy. And his, his comrade uh, Melville, this is a picture of late in life, uh, became a rear admiral and the engineer in chief of the entire U.S. Navy. So that's, that's the overview of this new book. Um, very different from the previous books. I don't know exactly, um, you know, I, I sort of suffer from a case of historical ADD. I jump around from time period to time period and from era to era. Um, but, uh, you know, these books are really, really hard to do. They require a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of travel. Uh, but it's, it's what I've been doing now for uh, 15, 20 years now. And I guess I'm going to keep doing it until till I can't do it anymore. Um, so I want to now just open it up to you guys. Uh, I want to hear from you. Any questions that you might have? I know there are a lot of students in the audience, some of whom are aspiring writers, people in the MFA program, English students, journalism students. So uh, love to hear from any of you, but especially from, uh, especially from the students. Any questions? Hotel on the Lamar, where uh, James already stayed night before. Mm -hmm. Do you know if it's still one of those hotel motels that's still out there? Uh, I think it's called the New Rebel, isn't it? Um, and the New Rebel Motel. Um, it's. I went to it. It's um, very much a don't tell motel right now. It's, it was rough. It was a rough place. Um, but in that day, it was a decent uh, motel. It was. It had a. Uh, neon sign out front with a Confederate colonel, uh, and it was uh, apparently very clean and uh, somewhat considered a reputable place, I suppose, um, at, in that time. Um, but uh, it's definitely changed a lot now. It's quite down, down at the heels. Uh, yeah, I went there. I mean, the great thing about doing these books is, is, is physically going to these places and uh, seeing if you can kind of get a glimpse of what it, what it was like, even if it's changed a lot. Uh, you can kind of squint your eyes and try to imagine what it was like 50 years ago. Um, and that's the joy of doing these books, is, is physically going to these places. Hi. Right. Um, well, it's really hard. Um, I I do a lot. I spend a lot of time kind of mapping out the book, and I don't I don't mean just an outline, but you know, just trying to figure out all the storylines, the main storyline, the secondary storyline, um, and what I tend to do is I write one storyline all the way through. Like I follow in that book. Uh, in, Hellhound, I'd follow Ray all the way through his movements, what, what we know about Ray. And then I would, you know, all, all in one <coughs> fell swoop, I'd write a bunch of that story. And then I would write a lot of the King story. And maybe a third story would be the FBI story or something. And um, so you have these three storylines, and then I would try to figure out how to stitch them together, splice them together. You kind of do the Edward Scissorhands thing, you know, and kind of find the break points and, and make them interconnect. Um, the uh, that's that's a puzzle. It's fun to do. It's kind of hard, but it's 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 a, it's a creative kind of puzzle that I enjoy. But um, in order to keep track of all the material, you know, uh, and and just not to go completely crazy, uh, I do write that one long storyline, and then I figure out how to break it up. Um, because I, I think when, you, when you're reading these books, um, I think one of the problems, one of the pitfalls of a lot of traditional history books is that they're topical and their idea of a chapter is topical. It's like, um, in this chapter, we're going to talk about 
some idea for 50 pages, you know. And um, it's not plot driven, it's, it's, an, it's about an idea. And it's a, it's a real big thing that is kind of hard to penetrate and it, it can get quite dull. But if you find a way to break that thing up and you know, take a sledgehammer to it, just smash it up into little pieces and then um, have shorter chapters and, or let's just say vary the length of the chapters, a short, a long, a medium size, and vary the point of view. Uh, so they have multiple storylines, it becomes a lot more interesting. Uh, uh, thanks, thank, you, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I'm just wondering in Hellhound, uh, what was the one thing that surprised or maybe even astonished you most about that whole episode that you didn't anticipate or never thought about? Um, what surprised me the most? Um, gosh. Uh, it's a hard, it's a hard one to say. I, you know, um, I spoke to a journalism class today earlier, and and uh, someone asked me, you know, how do you create suspense when there's a story that everyone knows the end, how it ends? And um, I thought about it for a while, and I decided that there's sort of like two kinds of suspense. You know, there's the suspense of what, and there's the suspense of how, and. We know the what, but we don't know the how. We don't know how it happened, you know, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. And that's what was surprising to me, is how little I knew about the how. Like, you know, what was Andrew Young doing? What was, what was you know, Jesse Jackson doing? What, what was uh, Ernest Withers doing? Little did I know he was doing a lot more than I thought when, when I <laughs> wrote the book. Um, there, you know, there, we think we know the story because we get these anniversaries every year. We see, we read the newspapers, we see the stories on television, but we don't know what they were really doing. Unless you slow down the clock and break it down, uh, you begin to realize, wow, oh, he did that, he did that, and oh, okay. You know, it's just much more surprising and much more complicated and much more interesting, I think. Uh, so uh, I guess the, the short answer to your question is what was most surprising to me is how little I knew about what happened. Uh, I thought I knew pretty much the story, and uh, I didn't. Uh, and I think that's true with a lot of history. When you, you know, you know the shorthand, you might know the, the what, you know the answer of the, or the resolution or the how it ends, but you don't necessarily know the how of, of how it got to that point. All the little twists and turns. Hi. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, you know, writing about characters like uh, James Gordon Livingston. Uh, who's kind of the Tony Stark of his era. Uh, and I'm wondering, when you're writing about such high-profile figures in your narrative, is there ever like a tendency to kind of want to mythologize them or maybe exaggerate what they've done? Or what they've... <coughs> like, how do you handle writing about these larger-than-life characters in a way that keeps it realistic? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, what I do in narrative history is often confused uh, with uh, another genre, uh, historical fiction. It's like a few clicks on the dial over, over to this side, and um, people will often say, you know, I love your novel. And I wince at that because <laughs> I can't tell you how hard I work trying to get the facts and um, to tell it as truthfully as I possibly can. Uh, it's not fiction, you can't make anything up. Um, it's non-fiction, it has that non in front of it. Um, <laughs> That said, uh, I don't necessarily believe that there is such a thing as total object objectivity. Um, uh, there is a lot of subjectivity. If something happened in this room today, uh, uh, there would be 300 interpretations of what uh, precisely what happened. And uh, so you, you have to uh, accept that and, and use the um, subjective uh, observations that participants, living participants in the event, um, had. Uh, for example, you know, there are moments in the story, the King story, where I, I have to rely on, let's say, Abernathy's account, because he was the only one in the room. Is Abernathy absolutely correct? Probably not, but he's the only one who was there. Um, so I used a lot of the interviews that he gave or um, his memoir. And I cite that, so if you want to know where it came from, it came from 
Abernathy, if there's some dialogue um, that um, if there's some dialogue that I use, it's coming from some source like Abernathy's book. Did Abernathy remember precisely how the conversation went down to every little word? No, of course not. But um, it's the best you can do. And as long as it's clear to the reader where you got it, I think uh, you're on solid ground. Um, but, yes, it, you were talking about mythologizing characters, these larger than life characters. Kit Carson is probably a prime example. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, he was mythologized for, for decades and decades um, as this great plucky American hero who do no wrong. Um, and now, of course, he's, he's widely castigate, castigated and, and hated by Native American tribes for his role in you know, rounding up the Navajo and, and uh, um, wrecking their, their culture and, and uh, sending them on this long walk. Uh, so how do you reconcile like a mythological character, a folk hero, who's also viewed in certain cult, uh, subcultures, and, and certainly in some of the Native American tribes, as being um, a genocidal maniac? You know, folk hero, genocidal maniac. Uh, how do you how do you reconcile that? And um, you know, the, the only way to really do it is not to uh, try to reconcile it. In fact, to kind of feast on all the contradictions and all the gray areas of, of these personalities. Because to me, the truth is in there, and the truth is in those details. Uh, there's no place in my book, Blood and Thunder, where I sum it all up and tell you, Kit Carson was a great man, or Kit Carson was a villain. Um, he did all these things. I don't know what it adds up to. It's very complicated. And uh, I think that's true in real life for most of us. Is, uh, we're all capable of great things, and we're, we're also capable of evil, and, uh, and it can often happen, happen in the same man uh, or woman. Um, so um, that's how you avoid mythologizing people, I think, is just to try to tell it, you know, tell it like it is. Institutions, because I think uh, it's one thing to write about individuals, but sometimes you tread upon a story that is uh, near and dear to the heart of an institution that has a lot invested in a, a certain storyline. Uh, sometimes it's propaganda, but sometimes it's not a very truthful storyline. Um, yeah, it's happened a lot, uh, especially in my journalism. Uh, these books, most of them are old stories. They're, they're, they're written about people who are quite dead, you know, good and dead, and uh, there aren't as many uh, conflicts like that. But, you know, when you do contemporary journalism for magazines, uh, you run into that a lot, you know, and you, you know, you, you have to be courageous. You have to realize it's going to come. You're going to, you're going to anger this institution and, you, you know, you're going to have to just tell it like it is and let the chips fall where they may. Um, you can't please everybody. In journalism, and those who, tr who do try to please everyone, especially big institutions, uh, usually fail in the end and end up pleasing no one. Uh, so um, it's, but it's a real thing, and I think a lot of people are intimidated by institutions, or you know, uh, establishment entities <laughs> that are out there and uh, don't really want to tell the real story for fear of what will happen. So you know, it's. Uh, it's something that uh, journalists especially struggle with all the time. I have a question about how you came upon deciding where, where are you? I'm to sorry, I can't see. Back here. Back here. Oh, okay. Um, it's clear why you chose King and, and probably um, our Wild West man. But mm -hmm. how did you find this story and how did you decide it was worth following it long enough to see if there really was a story there? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I found out about it um, by, let's see, National Geographic magazine asked me to write a profile of a historical figure, an explorer from Norway, whose name was uh, 
Fritjof Nansen. Nansen was an amazing guy who um, won the Nobel Peace Prize and was a statesman from Norway and uh, was an ambassador and he did all kinds of things. But in his early life, he was, a, he was an explorer. And before Amundsen, there was Nansen. And Nansen was the first man to cross, cross Greenland. He was an amazing competitive skier. You know, he did all these adventurous things. But uh, what he really wanted to do was go to the North Pole. And he decided what he was going to do was recreate the voyage of an obscure American thing called the Jeanette. Uh, obscure to me. It was well known in his time. This was the 1890s now. Uh, but he was going to do it in a ship designed differently. And this time not to find the open polar sea. They'd given up on that idea. This time it was to get locked in the ice deliberately and have the ice flows take you there uh, to get you to the North Pole. Uh, and just build a ship that would be designed not to be crushed in the, in the ice. Because uh, by that point, they learned a lot more about how to design these, these, the holes of these ships. I mean, this is crazy. You know, it's like, we're going to deliberately lock ourselves in this ice arc and drift for anywhere between three and four years and hope that we can get near enough to the North Pole that we can send some, some dogs out for a dash to the North Pole. Uh, well, he almost did it. He almost made it. Uh, Nansen um, uh, got pretty close to the North Pole, maybe 100 miles, and he got out on his, uh, uh, with, his with a companion and some dogs and uh, said goodbye to his ship and was going to make the dash to the North Pole, but fog intervened, he couldn't see anything, uh, his expedition fell apart very quickly, so he, he turned around and went back to the ship, and he couldn't find the ship. The ship was gone. And, you know, it drifts very slowly, but... I don't know, it was gone. So he had to sort of do the Jeanette expedition all over again with just two men, which was fun, you know, go across the ice cap. And uh, he nearly died. It's an amazing story, but he, he did survive. And he credited the Jeanette expedition, uh, the American expedition. And I'm an American, and here I am in Oslo. I've never heard of this thing. And I thought, no, that sounds fascinating. You know, like the Jeanette expedition. That, when I read about it, it was even more gothic and weird and, and strange and ambitious and, and heroic uh, and, and ultimately also tragic. Um, and I thought, this is great. Uh, as I dug into it a little further, it hadn't been written about in a long, long time. Um, it um, hadn't been written about particularly well. And uh, although it was extremely well known in the 1880s, uh, it was completely obscure, is completely obscure today. So I thought, this is that sweet spot that I think nonfiction writers and historians are looking for, which is a consequential story that has great primary material uh, that is obscure today. Uh, and it's like, the other dilemma with historians is, okay, well, what's popular? What do people like? Well, they like Lincoln. Evidently, they really like Lincoln. <laughs> so I'll write another book about Lincoln. There's 400 books a year written about Lincoln. Um, how do you find a new angle on Lincoln? Um, very important man. I'd love to find that, that magic angle on Lincoln, but I never found it. But this is sort of that sweet spot of, of an important story that's still obscure enough that I feel like I'm resurrecting something and, and breaking new ground. Um, yeah, somewhere in... Uh, right here. Okay, hi. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Um, first, I'd like to say, I, you know, in the Hellhound, on this trail. I really love the balcony scene with King and Abernathy and um, showing how close those characters are. And, the one you know, in Acapulco or the one in Memphis? You know, there's no, two. No, I'm sorry. The one in Acapulco yeah, 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 where yeah. they're on vacation. And with King looking out over the water and just um, that sense of foreboding, like death is like on this trail, like the hounds are like chasing King. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, uh, can you talk about some of the things that you think about when um, you want, when you think about engaging your readers, like in terms of craft? Because there's a lot of things um, working in that, in that scene, cause, and that's written in scene. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just interested in that, some of the things you think about um, in your revision process, you know, in terms of engaging your readers. Well, thank you, um, and I'm glad you singled that out. I, I, 
pretty proud of that because it's it's uh it is foreboding, it is it's foreshadowing, you know. It's uh these two men are on this balcony in Acapulco and uh King is really spooked and uh he's thinking about his own death and uh it's it, in so many ways prefigures what what does happen uh in a, in another year. Um and uh it was just a, a snippet really in Abernathy's memoir. Um that he also talked about in various interviews. And uh, I decided to make a little chapter out of it because it, it really just showed, not, you know, like the, the big dilemma for so many writers is to show not to tell. You know, to show your characters doing something as opposed to you, the writer, telling you, oh, this is what King is like. Uh, show him in his environment, uh, interacting. And uh, these were best friends and, uh, they needed so desperately to have a vacation, and they got this vacation, and uh, King is nowhere to be found in the room, and Abernathy's worried something, something's happened to him, and you find him out on that balcony, uh, looking at the, at the ocean. And um, so that's, you know, I think that narrative history is, is concerned with storytelling, uh, and it's concerned with taking the tools uh, and techniques uh, that you might more typically think of uh, or might typically associate with fiction um, and with screenwriting and with uh, uh, playwriting. Um, foreboding, uh, creating suspense, building up character, uh, using irony, uh, showing through scenes, through scene painting, uh, the character of people. Uh, and not, you know, getting, getting away from argumentation, getting away from exposition, getting away from uh, just that sort of uh, historian voice that we all, you know, learn in college, uh, that academic voice, um, which is the death of good writing, I think. I mean, we learn this way of talking when we're in college, uh, writing academic papers. And you have to get away uh, from that stilted voice, and, and um, uh, there's a scientific term for what, you, you have to have this medical uh, procedure um, it's called a corn cob ectomy. Um, you know, because I don't know where we get this voice, but we learn it in, in college and when we're writing these papers. And uh, it's not a real voice. It's not a natural, uh, interesting voice. It is, it is something that we think our professors want us to say and sound like. Um, so when you mention that one scene, I mean, that's just an example, I, I guess, of uh, what narrative history tries to do when it's good when, you know, when it, if, if it succeeds it's, it's through little scenes like that I think more than the big stuff it's the little details and uh, the little moments the little encounters uh, those are things that make it work we'll have one final question and okay. then uh, if everybody will allow our guests to get back to the table to sign books yeah I look so forward I'm to uh, signing books and meeting you guys uh, I guess it's just right out here in the, yeah. in the foyer okay One of my most uh, troublesome areas with writing narrative history has been the research. You always find the same information on the same big moments, but it's the little moments that link between that are so obscure. How do you go about finding the research, finding the sources? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, the most important thing is primary materials, you know, to get to the and to pare away all the books and papers and monographs and, and get to the, the diaries and the letters and the, the first person accounts and the newspaper accounts that were maybe written the day later. And those are the, you know, that's the raw material. And you start, at least you're on ground level working with the real stuff, you know. Uh, so that's really important. Um, you need to find, you know, some sort of source that makes your paper or your book, uh, your article a little different. Um, to have someone like Vince uh, is helpful, um, but pretty rare. Um, this book here, uh, in, in the Kingdom of Vice, I did have the experience which all historians uh, yearn for and never get. I mean, I've never had this happen before, and it was just, it was just that classic thing where a little old lady has a trunk in the attic full of letters that she's about to throw away. And would you would you have would you like them? Uh, Emma DeLong, the, the wife of George DeLong, uh, kept this trunk full of all the letters from um, from that period. And uh, 
photographs and uh, her own memoir and journal and the Long's journal and you know uh, and she asked me if, if I would take it please <laughs> and, uh, she lived in Newport, uh, Newport um, or West Westport Connecticut and I mean I flew there as quickly as I could get there and you know thank you very much and uh, uh, Catherine DeLong was her name and she uh, she gave me I mean she just gave me this great experience that you know I'll probably never get again which is the, the trunk of letters uh, all of which are now going to go to the Naval um, Academy uh, Museum and, and will be you know used for by you know future scholars but um, so you got to have a source like that when that happens it's really terrific and you know they, those sorts of things don't happen very often um, so yeah, letters, diaries, um, trunks, trunks and attics, uh, uh, what else? Um, obviously interviewing. I mean, uh, I think a lot of people are scared to interview people. They don't want to be nosy, they don't want to pick up the phone and, and be rude and, and uh, get in people's personal space. And I think that uh, it's really important to do that and to you know, get over that fear, that natural fear, because interviews uh, are often the way you really make this story come alive. Uh, you cut through all the source material and go straight to the person who maybe witnessed the event. Um, uh, I do a fair amount of teaching myself now. I teach at uh, Colorado College up in the Colorado Springs. And uh, I teach narrative nonfiction and I uh, make my kids go out and do these stories. And it's amazing how, how timid some of them are about you know, just that act of picking up the phone and calling someone and saying, I want to interview you with a tape recorder, you know. Get over that fear, because that's really important, is uh, learning how to talk to people, the art of interviewing, making people feel comfortable, and getting, getting the story. Um, so, so that's a big part of it as well. Um, I think that's about it. I hope to interview some of you guys uh, here afterwards. Uh, we're going to sign books and meet some of you, hopefully. And I uh, just want to thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.